From the Oklahoma Newsroom, it's time for the Red Zone, our weekly extended look at all things Sooner football. I'm Jenny Carlson here in studio with fellow columnist Barry Trammell and OU beat writer Ryan Aber. Guys, uh, still a lot of chatter about the TCU game. Uh, obviously coming off the Texas loss, a lot of people wanted to see what the uh, Sooner defense looked like with Ruffa McNeil at the helm. Ryan, what were your top of the head impressions coming away from that game? Well, that their defense looked better. Now, how much better remains to be seen because we know TCU's offense isn't that effective. But they tackled better. They seemed to be in, in better position. They weren't uh, running around like crazy as TCU tried to shift some things. The, those are all things that we had seen Oklahoma struggle with over the first part of the season. And on Saturday, they, they looked better in a lot of ways. There was that period right before the half where they really struggled once Michael Collins got in there at quarterback. But overall, a, an encouraging first step uh, in the Ruffin McNeil era. You know, we wondered about changes. Would there be personnel changes, you know, style changes? We didn't expect it to be like, oh, you're rolling out the wishbone back in the day, Barry. But did you feel like there was maybe more change than you were expecting out of the OU defense? Yeah, probably a little bit because we saw a little bit of change in a lot of areas. They ran a little more 4-3 than maybe they had in the past. They uh, use some new personnel, a couple of new starters, um, but uh, not drastic changes. Robert Burns played more. Uh, Ronnie Perkins started, uh, but not, not drastic changes. And they simplified things to some degree. Not as many audibles as the, as the uh, play clock is running down. So I don't know that they underwent massive changes. I think they just they did a little bit of tinkering and just, and just see what catches. And, uh, like Bobby Bear said, it's, it's right. You know, they played much better. Of course, they were playing TCU, and not just TCU, but a, a, a starting quarterback who was obviously not 100%, and a backup quarterback who hurt his hand and, uh, and, and sort of faltered after a fast start. So it was not a major test, but it was improvement. Ryan, after TCU went to Michael Collins, uh, they scored a couple touchdowns. We saw some old problems creep back in in terms of coverage and secondary and that sort of thing. Were there some concerning moments there for you just watching Michael Collins, uh, more of a passing quarterback, uh, showing some things that the Sooners have struggled with in the past? Well, sure. It's going to be a while before Oklahoma is going to face a, a quarterback who can test him in that way. But, yeah, we saw Oklahoma's secondary struggle, especially at cornerback. Uh, the, the, the touchdown to Gavante Turpin. There's another touchdown that completely blanking on the TCU receiver's name. But uh, yeah, those are, are things that certainly make you wonder how much better this defense is when you face teams that are going to face Texas Tech, who can throw it about around quite a bit here in a couple weeks, and then down the road with West Virginia especially, uh, Will Greer is going to test them too. Are they going to be able to look like that defense that looked like for three quarters of the game? Or are they going to look like that defense that uh, we saw in the second quarter? Well, and I think it, it's going to be interesting. We'll talk about sort of what we can expect moving forward here in a second. But, Barry, I thought as much as anything, you know, obviously the, the different personnel that Ruff and McNeil went with, you know, we, we sort of questioned would some guys maybe reemerge. And we, we definitely saw some, some different things, some different guys get some chances and, you know, tended to play pretty well. Yeah, Trey Brown played more at corner. Still used the three-man rotation with Trey Norwood, Parnell Motley, and Trey Brown. But Trey, Br Trey Brown definitely played more, and I thought played pretty well. Uh, we saw Ronnie Perkins start out at, at end in that 4-3. Um, we saw uh, a new free safety in Robert Barnes, and um, uh, we saw the true freshman, uh, Yale Turner. Darren Yale Turner had not even hit the field, and he played some. Jalen so, Redmond, same Jaylen thing. Jalen Redmond, same thing, a true freshman. So we saw some new personnel. And, you know, I don't think it's it's not uh, an indictment of the old guys. It's not a, a some sign of sign of the cavalry coming to rescue everyone. It's just let's try some new guys and see what happens. And uh, it generally it generally was positive. So I think we'll see some more of that. Yeah, Ryan, were you a little surprised about those young guys, particularly Redmond and and Turner Yell? I mean, I know obviously injuries. We didn't expect to see Jalen Redmond this season, yeah. much less that last week. I mean, was that a, a pretty big surprise from your uh, perspective? Yeah, that was probably the biggest surprise when you talk about the personnel changes that was made, including, like Barry mentioned, the, the uh, cornerback and safety changes, but also Justin Broyles, who had started at uh, safety quite a bit this year, is back at cornerback on Oklahoma's depth chart. But, uh, yeah, J Delarian Turner Yell is a guy that they talked about 
that was going to be a, a player for them and was going to get on the field immediately before the season. And then when we didn't see him, it was like, ah, well, he sort of almost wrote off his freshman year. Well, it turns out that uh, he's back healthy and back to where they think he's going to contribute significantly this year. Jalen Redmond was a guy that I don't think anybody expected to see on the field until a couple weeks ago when he got cleared. And I think it was a surprise to most people, including Lincoln Riley, when he got cleared for action this season. But he's uh, caught up pretty quickly. It's still going to take him a little bit of time to get fully immersed in what Oklahoma is doing defensively. But uh, some positive signs for the Sooners from those two guys, especially on the front where they need some depth up there, if, especially if they're going to keep going with that four-man look. Now the question becomes, what does this all mean moving forward? Because obviously uh, there was a lot of emotion uh, with, around that TCU game. They were coming off a of bye week. Barry, uh, you know, maybe not even specific to this week against K-State, but the changes you saw, what does this all mean moving forward in your mind? Oh, I don't know that it has long-lasting meaning. Other than, you know, I think some of these young guys will play more. I mean, they were big on Yale Turner. They were big on Jalen Redman, big on Ronnie Perkins. Um, these are guys that clearly can help uh, on some level, so that will matter. But I don't know that you can, you know, I don't know that you can really uh, extrapolate the success in Fort Worth to what they're going to see against against Tech and Lubbock, against West Virginia and Morgantown, against whoever in a potential Big 12 title game. Um, so I, I just think it, it's, it's a chance to get some new blood in there and, and some of those guys and let some of the veterans know, you know, some some – some guys who had been playing, their playing time went down. Let them know that, you know, there is an accountability process and that if you don't produce, you can be replaced. Ryan, what's your, what's your sort of, as you think forward about what all this means moving ahead, what do you sort of see it equating out to over the next month or six weeks? Well, I think it's like Barry mentioned, you know, TCU is not very good offensively, so what is this going to mean against West Virginia and, and Texas Tech and, you know, potentially Texas again or possibly West Virginia a second time? The answer is probably not much, but this defense just needed confidence. Yeah. We talked about it last week. Their confidence was down after what had happened against uh, Texas, against uh, Iowa State, against Army, and they just needed something to start bringing that up. It's not complete yet, but uh, they're a whole lot closer to it than they were a week ago. Let's talk for just a second about K-State and their offense because you know, sort of in the same way that TCU is not like a normal Big 12 offense, but largely because of their struggles at quarterback uh, of late. K-State, just by design, is not like most Big 12 offenses, Ryan. They don't pass it a ton. They don't try to pass it a ton. What's the challenge for the Oklahoma defense this week against the Wildcats? Well, the challenge for Oklahoma's defense is uh, containing a mobile quarterback. They've struggled with that. They, Kansas State likes to run their quarterback quite a bit. Uh, they're not going to test Parnell Motley, uh, Trey Brown, Trey Norwood down the field as much as a lot of these other Big 12 teams, which is a good thing for Oklahoma with some of their struggles on the back end. But at the same time, Oklahoma has sometimes struggled to tackle well, uh, to, to bring down a, a mobile quarterback. We've seen it. We saw it against Texas at times. We've seen it uh, for the last few seasons. And that's going to be something that's key to this one. They tackled better on Saturday in Fort Worth but they have to keep it up against a Wildcats team that's not great, but it can take advantage of you in some ways. Well, and while they, they don't look like a lot of Big 12 offenses, Barry, what they do, they do in some instances with almost surgical precision when it comes to the run game, just the way that their offensive line can operate. That, that can be problematic even against a defense that uh, you know, has struggled more against the pass than, say, the run. It's not like playing Army. Right. It's not to that extent. But there's some elements of that. Kansas State does not try to overpower you. They don't try to out-athlete you. They try to out-execute you. They try to put you in places where they're not going to be. And Bill Snyder's a master at that. Um, we saw it against Oklahoma State. The Wildcats get three points at halftime, uh, first half. Come out, four drives, four long touchdown drives. They figure out where you're weak, and that's where they attack. and, and so you got to play disciplined against Kansas State, um, and you know they, they're not a they're not a uh, an elite passing team, but they suck you in and then they can hit you deep. We've seen that for for decades from Bill Snyder. So it is going to be it, to me it's going to be a mental test. It's not a physical test when you play Texas or somebody. They're going to challenge you physically. Kansas State challenges you mentally, and to me that's a good test for this 
defense that's been revamped. Well, we've talked a lot about defense. We haven't talked at all about uh, that Sooner offense, which continues to roll, guys. I mean, we we used the word historic a week ago, and here we are, you know, still in terms of historic and the things that this offense is doing. Uh, it, it may be noteworthy that they're so good that now one of the biggest scuttlebutts is celebration. <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> they celebrated, uh, I say they, C.D. Lamb, Marquise Brown. They've been celebrating after touchdowns, but... We saw it lead to a short kickoff, a kickoff return against TCU. Now a lot of people want to talk about the celebration. <laughs> What's the latest with the celebrations? Well, C.D. Lamb said on Monday night that the celebration is dead, <laughs> that uh, it is no more. They, they won't bring it out. Uh, C.D. Lamb and Marquise Brown have been doing the you know rock, paper, scissors thing. They've been doing the Dragon Ball Z a couple times with the exaggerated handshake. And they have got flagged for it on Saturday with the Dragon Ball Z one. And uh, Lincoln Riley said, well, I've just got to do a better job of coaching. <laughs> C.D. Lamb lamented its loss uh, on, on Monday to us and after the game when we talked to him. But uh, no more uh, celebrations from those two, at least in that way. He said it's just too dangerous. They don't want to, to take it up to that line of being choreographed, which is the rule. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's a lot of OU fans are really happy about it. I don't think there's the players aren't really happy about it. It's sort of ridiculous that uh, that celebration. It wasn't like something exaggerated that took, you know, even 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. It was just a couple second uh, handshake thing. Yeah. But uh, it is no more. But like you said, the the choreographed is is the is the rule. What if I, what if they just ran to the sideline? Uh, Instead of in the end zone, run to the sideline and yeah. do it. But I mean, to me, it's like. 10 second delayed celebration. Yeah, I think. The, wouldn't that be an, a solution to the problem? Yeah, I think it would be. And, you know, I think what got them is there's a, a moment in the Dragon Ball Z celebration where they sort of cock their arms back. And I, I think that that, uh, that got them. I can't say I'm very familiar with Dragon Ball Z uh, <laughs> to, to know what that's all about. Yeah. But uh, I think just that little moment is what, what caused it for them. But yeah, if they just went back to the sideline and did it, great. It's fun, it's interesting. You know, there's so much, you know, more pressing things, it seems like, mm -hmm. that we could be worried about. I understand why it's a rule, but uh, it seems sort of ridiculous. And it cost Oklahoma a touchdown. Yeah, it uh, sure did. Austin Cyber almost still got it in the end zone, but that almost still getting in the end zone is what cost him because, you, you know, the, the uh, old ploy about uh, out kicking your coverage. Yeah. He out kicked his coverage. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I think if it was just spontaneous, there's a likelihood that, nothing gets called but um that is the rule is it is it too is it too strict barry in your mind that college football has no choreographed and and that it's as strict as that well probably not because can we all agree the nfl celebrations are a little over much. the top they're yeah. a little much yeah. i mean yeah. yeah but i i would honestly i would rather have it that way than the old way in the nfl where anything got you a flag now uh, it, i mean if you just celebrate, but people don't. Now, yeah. the, the lamb and Hollywood Brown, that's pretty minor. I agree with you. But the word choreographed seems to me to be a solid word. Yeah. It's a pretty good line of demar demarcation. So uh, just run over to the sideline. Heck, you might only be 10 feet from it. Just run over to where yeah, the refs aren't. Yeah. The refs well, never look at the sideline. on line. that play, I don't know that Marquise Brown was relatively even close to the end zone well, yeah, or close to where CeeDee Lamb caught it. I know yeah. CeeDee Lamb on the TV replay, I watched it this morning, there was not another player on the that's true. screen <laughs> when he yeah, uh, made his he way did, into the end know, zone. He did, the, he did the cross and out. So, yeah, it was it, – I don't, I don't want to see college football get to the level of the NFL, so – I don't have a problem with the rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, enough about celebrations. We're, let's talk about some X's and O's for a second on the offensive side uh, because uh, we saw on Saturday at TCU Kennedy Brooks continue to emerge, guys. I mean, Trey Sermon, I think he's their best running back, but now I'm not so <laughs> sure. I mean, Barry, you've been pretty solidly behind the idea that Trey Sermon is number one, no doubt about it. Are we starting to see that change? I don't think so, but I am very impressed with Kennedy Brooks. I will say this. I don't know why. Maybe this ha he has something to do with this. But a couple, three times in the last two, three weeks, they've created monster holes for the guy. I mean, yeah. it's just to keep – he's, he's in the secondary. Now, he made a beautiful cut uh, the way that we were sitting in Fort Worth 
we were at an angle and they were coming right at us and you got a view of the game you don't generally get. He made a beautiful cut to you know, turn a 10 yard gain into 30 or 40, whatever it was. 43, I think. Okay, but he's a, he's a fantastic runner, but I still am partial to Trey Sermon. You get stronger as the game goes on. He's pretty good in the open field. We saw him, you know, if, if, uh, if, if the OU Texas game could have gone, you know, five minutes longer, he'd have finished with 800 yards rushing because Texas had just surrendered the white flag. They were no longer interested in tackling him. So um, I think he's still the bell cow, but Kennedy Brooks is a very worthy sidekick. It, it seems like people forget how good Trey Sermon is. And, you know, it happened last year, and understandably so, when Rodney Anderson does what Rodney Anderson did in the second half of the season, starting with the, the Kansas State game, sort of like this year. We saw a little flash of it in Texas, and then he took off from there. But uh, Trey Sermon has had a lot of really big moments for the Sooners, including the Ohio State game last year. We've mentioned it a couple times. Uh, he, he, in that Texas game, like Barry mentioned, the Longhorns wanted no part of him. Yes, Trey Sermon's a little banged up, and we'll see what that means for Saturday. Yeah. But moving forward, I mean, Trey Sermon is still, as good as Kennedy Brooks has been, Trey Sermon's still their best overall option at running back. That said, that margin has gone from this to this. Kennedy Brooks, I love the guy in high school from what I saw of him on film, went down there actually, actually at his signing day ceremony and came away really impressed with him, and he's finally showing that on the field. Guys, I know that Oklahoma gets great running backs out of high school. I mean, they get really good talent. But to me, the way we see these guys continue to, near as I can tell, get better, whether it's Rodney Anderson getting better last year as he got healthier, you see Trey Sermon continue to evolve, now Kennedy Brooks evolve. I mean, these guys are not only really good, but I think they're, they're, they're improving. It's not just a, a stagnant get to a point and stop. Barry, the depth, I mean, we talked about this just last week. The depth, it just continues to, I mean, I was going to say amaze, and then I stopped myself, and I, now I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to actually use the word amaze. It's amazing. Well, and they get a lot of help. Uh, I thought the offensive line improvement was very solid on the last few weeks. The last two games they've gone against uh, two of the best big defenses in the Big 12, and they've run very well, uh, Texas and TCU. Um, and, you know, the, the passing success, Baker Mayfield last year, Kyler Murray this year makes a defense, have to worry about that. So they got, they got a lot going for them, but clearly, uh, you know, when the Sooners lost P. Ryan and Mixon, you had to think, well, can they get back to that level? I don't know that they're at that level the last two years, but it's very high. And it, and it seems to be replenished because, frankly, I, I thought T.J. Pledger was a fantastic prospect, still do, but Kennedy Brooks has sort of jumped him here. Uh, well, yeah, he's so, jumped Marcellus Sutton right. as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very impressive core of, of uh, tailbacks, no doubt about it. What do you chalk this all up to, Ryan, when you think about the fact that, as Barry said, I mean, even if you just look back a couple years ago, talking about losing two NFL backs, and here they sit having lost who, the guy who looked to be the best replacement in Rodney Anderson are still running so well. What do you chalk that all up to? Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do with their, their coaching and development. When you talk about uh, Kale Gundy a few years ago uh, did a really good job with it, and, and Jay Bulwers continued that with, you know, some of those guys, you know, Joe Mixon, uh, anybody wanted, everybody in the country wanted him, you know, back in the day, Adrian Peterson, all these guys, they've had a lot of TJ pleasures that way, guys who every program in the country wanted, but there's other guys, you know, Samaje Piran wasn't a, a massive five-star guy, he was a, a really highly thought of recruit, but wasn't a, a big-time guy. Kennedy Brooks wasn't a guy that really jumped off the table for you with his measurables, but once they get the players there, they've been able to develop them and keep them moving forward, like you said. And I, I think the credit for that goes to uh, Jay Bulwer uh, presently and their, their running back staff before that with Kale Gundy. They have not missed on guys. They've definitely got good talent, and then they've gone and developed I mean, heck, it. Heck, they even lost Abdul Adams last year to right. transfer. And you know we saw some of the things that he did last year with the 99-yard run against Baylor, mm -hmm. had some really good games himself and just couldn't find uh, playing time for him consistently. So uh, it, it's just incredible the way that they're able to keep stocking that cupboard with guys. And when one goes down, another one comes in, and they yeah. don't seem to miss much of a beat. Yeah, I'm still surprised by that. I still thought Lincoln Riley was 
pimple in our legs when he said, we'll just put somebody else out <laughs> there after Rodney Anderson got hurt. But lo and behold, that's exactly what they've done, and they haven't really missed, uh, missed much there. All right, guys, let's get to picks uh, as we look ahead to this Oklahoma K-State game on Saturday. It's a 2.30 kick down in Norman. Ryan, you've uh, made your pick uh, 54-17 Sooners. Yeah, and, you know, thinking of it when we're sitting here, I'm, I'm wondering if that, that 54 number might have been the too low one. You know, Barry mentioned some of the, the defenses. Barry's, <laughs> Barry's looking, looking bi well, big-eyed over it, here. <laughs> and it, came, it comes from Barry. Barry mentioned that the defenses that they faced. Here's the scary thing about Oklahoma's offense. They faced the three best defenses in this league when you talk about Texas, TCU, and Iowa State. And they're still the most efficient offense in the country when you talk about points per possession. Uh, I think what's, uh, yeah, points per possession is the big one. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think there's another stat that was really similar to that. They're putting up points against everybody. Yeah. Kansas State's defense has been really good. This isn't the, the old time Bill Snyder defenses. Uh, Oklahoma's going to be able to score uh, with this team. It's just a question of how much Kansas State's going to be able to score. That 17 number might be too low as well. But if I'm going to bet on one where I have to take the over on, I'm taking it on OU's side. All right, Barry, who you got on Saturday? Well, I got the Sooners, clearly, but um, I'll probably have to go. You know what? I, I, I think Bobby Hebert was in the right neighborhood of the score. I just didn't know why he felt he had to move up to a higher neighborhood. Go move, <laughs> move, he's moving on up to the east side. He's calling for 60 on this. He's calling for 60 you're, you're something. Closer to the high I mean, 40, they, huh? they scored 52 against TCU last week. Yes, they sure did. I was there. I saw it. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. I think that. I think they got a good chance to get in the 50s. I also think though that Bill Snyder will shorten the game. You know, he likes to play eight possession games, and True. if. If you get eight possessions and you score, uh, if you have one failure, Six or seven you're times, not getting to yeah. 50. You're going yeah. to get stuck at 49. Yeah. So I would probably go a little under that. I'd probably go 49, 20, something like that. Uh, let's, in fact, I'll write that down. 49, 20 <laughs> Sooners. I'm That's going 52, right there, 17 for a lot of the same reasons you guys talked about. We think it's going to be an Oklahoma win pretty easy. Be sure to check out our picks in the Thursday Oklahoman and be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com every day in the Oklahoman. Thank <laughs> you.